Sermon 99, True Love Chapel, Las Vegas, Nevada. We're going to be in the book of James today. And um, let's go ahead and pray and we'll get going. Almighty God, please bless the sermon. Bless me in uh, my preaching. Please open up our hearts to receive the truth that you have for us. Please keep giving us new insight into your word and strengthen us in our faith and obedience to you, Lord God. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, Book of James. James is a short book. It's uh, five chapters. So this uh, the reading assignment had us just going through the entire James uh, this week. And... Um, so we'll just uh, we'll just talk about it a little bit. So the book of James, um, a lot of people think James was written by the disciple named James, and uh, that's actually not the case. Um, the The letter of James was written by this fellow named um, he's known as James the Just, and um, and. Uh, it was written in um, during this period of time between uh, Christ's resurrection and the destruction of the temple. So the resurrection was in most people consider it A.D. 33. Um, by some estimations, it could be as early as A.D. 30, depending on how you calculate the years. But it's approximately 30 or 33. And then the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem was in A.D. 70. So you have basically a 40-year period from the resurrection of Jesus Christ until the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. And during that 40 years is when they wrote the entire New Testament. Okay. And uh, James was one of the earlier books, um, possibly written around AD 40, about, you know, five or ten years after the resurrection. And so it was one of the earlier books. Um, this was written before the, uh, the council at Jerusalem. So the, those issues were not mentioned in it. So it is one of the early, the early works. Now, this guy, James the Just, who I just uh, mentioned, what is so intriguing about James the Just? Who was this guy? He wasn't, I said he, he was not one of the disciples. So who was he? James the Just is actually the brother of Jesus Christ. And I should say the, uh, the half-brother because um, they had a common uh, mother. They had the Mary, was uh, both of their mothers, but uh, they had different fathers because Jesus Christ, his father is God Almighty. And, um, and so... James the Just, his father would have been Joseph, but that that's that's interesting. Okay, that's a serious claim to fame. But nevertheless, in the first verse of the book, it says James, a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I mean, he makes no mention. He doesn't say James, I, hey, I'm the brother of Jesus. You know, no, no, no. He, uh, he calls himself bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, these were brothers, right? They grew up together. And um, one, of the, uh, one of the unique, fascinating things about this is just the fact that James was not even a believer of Jesus Christ. He was not even a follower of Jesus Christ until the resurrection. So that is, that is an important piece of information right there. Um, all throughout Jesus' earthly ministry, certainly during the time they grew up together, when uh, Jesus was more or less just growing as a normal person and he, his, uh, his divinity was more or less um, was not revealed at that time, until Jesus had his earthly ministry, which has only lasted about three years, three and a half years, and um, even during that time of Jesus's ministry, James did not believe that Jesus was God. You know, he didn't believe that he was the son of God. He didn't believe he was God. As far as he knew, that was his brother that he grew up with. And it was just like, 
somebody just like him. And maybe he's nothing special. He's just a regular guy. So he figured this guy, Jesus, must have been just a regular guy just like him. After all, they grew up together. So what's different? And then uh, even though he heard the stories about the preaching, the miracles and all this, the crowds following Jesus, um, you know, there's something that's just, it's hard to fathom, hard to swallow that, hard to understand that, you know, until you see it for your own eyes. And he actually saw the, you know, he witnessed the resurrection of Jesus Christ and that totally convinced him. And, uh, and actually that changed the whole course of history, um, that resurrection. The fact that the tomb is empty and that even the enemies of uh, Christianity could not deny that the tomb is in fact empty. And, um, and then furthermore, it wasn't just an empty tomb, it wasn't just missing, but Jesus actually appeared in his resurrected body um, over a 40 day period on some 12 separate occasions recorded here. And he appeared to thousands of people, eyewitnesses. And, um, and then those eyewitnesses, they were in the position to know if it was true. That is so significant. Once you understand human psychology and everything, how, how it works. And, and this is actually a thing, the way they uh, examine witnesses, cross-examine them, and uh, it, it actually is used in court in modern days, and it's evidence in court um, the way eyewitnesses, two or three eyewitnesses, when their accounts are uh, complementary and the, when they don't, they're not able to collude. Um, and just just goes down to how you break down the details, how you interrogate the, uh, the witnesses separately. And you, you can find the story of what happened. Now, we're talking about thousands of people and thousands of people who were willing to give up all that they had in the world to, for the sake of what they witnessed with their own eyes and follow Jesus Christ. And many of them were Jews. They, uh, they had to leave their status their, in society, which was um, you know, a position of honor, a position of, you know, social standing and they they had to leave all that behind to convert to christianity and to become like wanted criminals um, all for the sake of what they had witnessed and again they were in the position to know if it was true you know people some sometimes people will die for something that they believe is right but nobody believes i mean excuse me nobody dies for something that they know is wrong that they know is false you know, if you really believe it's true, then maybe, yeah, maybe you'll sacrifice yourself to go die for it if you really believe it. But nobody is going to sacrifice their own life and die for something that they know is a lie. And these people were in the position to know the truth. And we're talking thousands of them. And then, of course, with the, uh, the, the coming of the Holy Spirit and all that. So now we have this testimony that we hear not just what they are telling us, but we actually get to witness it for ourselves as Christians when we are convinced, you know, something just, you know, because the evidence isn't what convinces you. It's something, something. It's that Holy Spirit. That's what it is. The Holy Spirit is calling you. It's the revelation from God. You know that it's true. Then when you take the step to accept that truth for yourself, then that is when, um, you get to experience the Holy Spirit in your life and you get to become a child of God and you know it. The Spirit testifies to our spirit that we are children of God. Okay. So anyway, that all that is quite interesting. And I also want to say that, um, that James, after all this, you know, and around uh, the time when he wrote this, you know, he was already a believer for some five or ten years. He became sort of the overseer of all the churches in Jerusalem. So he was the head of all the churches in Jerusalem. Um, he was one of the serious church leaders at this time. And uh, why is that significant? Well, a number of reasons. One reason it's significant, um, we can go back to, um, remember when uh, Jesus was talking to the disciples and uh, Peter was there and uh, he asked him, uh, 
Well, he's asking them, who do people say that I am? And they, and they said, like, people say you're a prophet or you're something, you're Moses or you're Elijah, whatever that was they were saying. And he said, and uh, who do you say that I am? And he asked Peter, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of God. And, um, and, uh, and Jesus said, um, like, very good. And uh, he said something like uh, the Holy Spirit revealed it to him. And then he said, uh, on this rock, I will build my church. Okay. Um, now, wh why, why I just pull this up out of nowhere, it's because nowadays the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, they claim that Peter was the first pope. Okay. And that could not be the, the case. I disagree with that. But they say because he said, on this rock, I will build my church. Their claim is that he was the first pope and that, that the pope was ordained by Christ himself. And uh, I have to disagree with that respectfully, but um, I will have to do, disagree with that. So first of all, he said, um, you know, on this rock, I will build my church. Well, first, the rock is the confession of faith in Jesus Christ. But we know from elsewhere in the Bible that we all have the same foundation, which is Christ. And on that we build and that Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. OK, so we're not building on another foundation. We have the foundation, the rock. OK, the foundation is Jesus Christ. But why did he, he say this on this rock? I will build my church um, because the name Peter, it means rock. There was a play on words. That's all it was. And, um, and that's all it was. And another reason Peter couldn't have been the uh, first pope, Peter was married. And um, another thing, uh, and then the other thing I want to point out was later in Acts, when we, when we do get to the council in Jerusalem, which is uh, after this book of James was written, but in Acts, at the Council at Jerusalem, we can see that James, this fellow James here, James the Just, he was the one in charge. He had the authority at the Council at Jerusalem, not Peter. So if Peter was the first pope or something, if he was like the, the leader of all the Christians, and he was there, he would have been the leader, right? Not, not James. So right there we can see that the story doesn't check out. Certainly, Peter was a, a great hero of the faith, for, cer for sure, certainly. But he was not somehow a pope or something. That was just made up by the Roman Catholic Church. And um, so, I mean, they were all great. There was not one leader over them all. That, I mean, you had guys like um, Paul. Paul also was a, a big leader. And Paul rebuked um, Peter at one point. So that also shows that... Peter didn't have like this high standing over them both. But um, I mean, they all had their roles to play in, in the places that God put them. So I just want to put that out, just a little background story and all this. Okay, moving forward. James, the book of James. What is so, um, you know, what is it talking about in James? The most famous verse, I think, is where it talks about faith without works is dead. And we're not actually going to be in that chapter today. I'm not focusing on it, but it's in there. And also, he, he does talk a lot about the tongue, if you could control your tongue and all that. But, but the thing, faith without works is dead. Um, that's something James says, whereas Paul says, uh, we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Okay? And um, elsewhere it says... Uh, in Ephesians, is it? Yeah, I always get this one confused. I think it's in, in Ephesians chapter 2. It's just, just about the... Uh, mm, by grace you have been saved through faith. Yeah, verse 8. Ephesians 2, verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Verse 9. Not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. So it's not works, but then James um, also, James says faith without works is dead. So what is he saying? Is there a conflict between these two writers of the Bible? And, and there is not. Certainly there is not. 
they're both inspired by the Holy Spirit. They're both the Word of God. And so what we can, what we can know by that is that when we say faith without works is dead, what he's really saying is it's not a real faith. Because he also says, um, I'll show you my faith with my good works, and you show me your faith with, without your good works. He's saying you don't have a real faith, because if you had a real faith, it's, it's, this, it's this living, active faith. It is a faith, it is a relationship that we have with God. It, the faith brings us into this relationship with God, which is life-transforming and life-changing. And so for you to say you have faith with God, faith in God, meaning saying, because we're saved by grace, by grace received through faith. So if you're saying you have faith in God, faith in Jesus Christ, you put your faith in Jesus Christ, that means you're receiving the grace of God. And for you to say that you have received the grace of God, you've become a child of God, and then for you to not, not, have any good works in your life that that's just that's impossible so it's showing that if you don't have good works then you don't have the relationship with God you don't have the faith it's just a byproduct of knowing God Almighty when you have a relationship with Lord God Almighty then uh, it changes you it transforms your life that's what it, we're saying and that's the real uh, faith now I had a uh, Illustration. Okay, imagine this. Imagine you had a, a person who was blind. And uh, maybe he's blind for many years. And so he, he gets this habit of closing his eyes as he goes about life. And why not? He can't see anyway, right? So he just closes his eyes. You know, with your eyes open when you're blind, it kind of freaks people out. So you might as well just close your eyes and it makes no difference to him. He's blind anyway. And then God intervenes and works a miracle, heals this guy, opens his eyes. Suddenly he can see. He sees the light. He sees all the colors. He sees the world around him in light. Okay. This is my illustration. Now, now that guy, is he now going to go through his life still with his eyes closed? No, he is not. No, he is not. Now he's going to go through life with his eyes open because now he can see. And, and he, you know, he's seen the light. He's seen the goodness of God, this gift of sight that's been given to him. And he wants more of it. He's seen the goodness of God blessing him with this, and he wants more of it. And not a single person, if this happened to anyone, nobody is going to you know, receive their sight after being blind and then continue to walk around with their eyes closed. Nobody will do that. And I think this is a, a decent, it's a decent illustration. It may, it may be not perfect, but it's decent. And uh, it just shows that a person who's living in darkness, here's, you know, if someone's living in darkness and then suddenly they see the light of Christ and Christ you know, has just shined on them, um, your life is going to be impacted. It's going to be different. It's going to be changed, transformed. You're not going to go back into living in darkness. Once you have tasted and seen that the Lord is good, then you're going to want more of it. You have this hunger and thirst for righteousness. So you care about the things of God more and more and more. And so that's how you're able to... Uh, you know, now you start to, to learn how to serve God with your life, and that results in good works. Uh, that's, that's just one illustration. You know, another way to say it is just because of the Holy Spirit living in you, it's going to be conforming you. And uh, certainly we have that great helper, that comforter, that Holy Spirit in us, and, um, you know, even the Spirit of truth to be with us forever. So the Holy Spirit helps us in a lot of ways, and um, the Holy Spirit uh, works with our conscience. So as children of God, with the Holy Spirit in us, if we start to backslide or we start to, you know, our stubborn old self starts to uh, get in the way again, then uh, the Holy Spirit will convict us regarding sin. And uh, it 
In other words, we'll have a bad feeling when we sin. We have a, a good conscience means we're going to have a bad feeling when we sin. And then also when we come back closer to God, then we have a good feeling, right? So it's like you don't, you don't want to keep having that bad feeling of going back into sin. So eventually you learn how to sort of break that cycle and uh, get closer to God, get right with God. And then you feel so much joy, the more closer to God that you get. And so that's kind of one of the ways that God leads us and guides us. It's just through our conscience. We'll feel peace. We'll feel happiness and joy when we're following God, when we know we're in the will of God. We're walking in the spirit. We're walking, you know, according to God's will. We have a very good feeling about that. And if we uh, stumble, then we don't feel so good until we get, can get right back right with God. So, <clears throat> well, that was a tremendous introduction to James. Uh, in my defense, I would have to say, I mean, we're covering five chapters here in one sermon, more or less. I'm going to just give you an overview of the book as we go along, whatever is on my heart, whatever the Lord puts on my heart. But uh, another thing I wanted to touch upon was in chapter 4. So let's look at this. It's called Things to Avoid in James chapter 4. Verse 1, what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. Okay, let's just stop right there. Um, uh, the source of your quarrels and conflicts. Yeah, it's, it's, it tells us right here. It's the, the source is the, uh, the pleasures that wage war in your members. In other words, it's the flesh. It's the old man that keeps wanting to come back. And we have to keep beating them down, beating the flesh into submission. We do that by walking a spiritual walk, like I was talking about in the introduction, um, through fellowship with God. I mean, through good habits, I, I could expound upon that. Uh, prayer, fellowship, Bible study, fasting, uh, ministry, um, just various good Christian habits, doing the things that we know that we need to do. Especially getting in the Word. That's one of the most powerful things that you can do. Learning the Scriptures um, will have a huge impact. And also the, the fellowship, you know, be involved with church, um, prayer, super important. Ministry, getting just getting involved with church, not just showing up to watch. But, I mean, people understand that people need you, too. Your gifts are useful to serve the body of Christ just as they are also serving you. So that's the way it's supposed to work. And a lot of times, um, a lot of times people want to have it both ways. They want to be comfortable with the world. They're not ready to like make the clean break. And uh, I don't know I, I don't, what it is. They just, they, they're not there yet. They don't feel it yet. They're not strong enough in the spirit, in their faith. To, uh, to sort of break free. So they, they feel like they kind of want to have it both ways, which makes you in a worse position. You're, that's the lukewarm Christian. But as we go on into the next verse, you adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Wow, that's powerful. So even being a friend of the world makes you an enemy of God. So what does that tell you? The world is very, very, very much against God. To where for you to even be a friend to the world makes you an enemy of God. That's how much against God the world is. Um, so the world, the world system is actually evil. And it, it comes, it comes from... Uh, the pit of hell, you know, what I mean, the world system is just wrong. And uh, when you when you try as a Christian, I mean, we, we're going to talk about this as Christians, because it says, what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? 
And James was a dire, uh, addressing this to the Christians in Jerusalem, which many of them were Jewish Christians, Jews who became Christians. So the primary audience here was Christians. And I think, um, you know, the whole thing wouldn't really apply to unbelievers because they don't even have a spiritual side. So for them, their, their entire life is just quarreling and conflict, and their entire life is being hostile toward God. But for Christians, that's the thing. Even Christians can fall back into this. And, um, and he just nails it right there. It's because you're being a friend of the world. It's because you're trying to uh, have it both ways. You want the world to like you, and you want God to like you, right? Can't, why can't everyone just like you, huh? <laughs> and, um, you know, that's one of the problems they were having back then. They just wanted to get along with everyone. They wanted that honor from the world. They wanted also to be right with God, and it wasn't happening. What was actually happening is they ended up with quarrels and conflicts because, you know, in a, in a way it's that selfishness. They wanted the honor and... They wanted to be friendly with the world to get it, and they ended up just compromising with evil. And this, these bad things came in, these conflicts and these uh, quarrels. And it goes on that you, you know, um, you lust and you do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You know what I mean? And it says you, you do not have because you don't ask. <laughs> you ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so you may spend it on your pleasures. Oh well, yeah, that's something to think about right there. It's like, um, yeah, God is not here to serve us in our selfishness, in our, uh, you know, our pridefulness. It's, it's not about building us up. It's, we need to be humble and uh, come to God in a, uh, in a humble way. And uh, when we pray, you know, prayer with God, it's really, it's not primarily about just giving a list of things to God that we want. Now, I know that we, we oftentimes pray that way um, about things that we want, but it's not really primarily about that because prayer is more about bringing you into the will of God, into what God wants and bringing you sort of into this like harmonious Thing where you pray, you begin to pray for the things that God wants. And when you pray for the things that God wants, they happen, they come true. And so there's something about that, you know, having a prayer life like that, which is not just, it's not just focused on yourself. I mean, I know we do pray for ourselves a lot. That's almost just like human nature. But it's not only that. You're also praying for other people. You're praying for things. You're praying for things that the scripture tells you that God wants. And you're praying in one accord with these types of things that we know that God wants. And then you get to see things happening. Um, things happen. And that's really energizing in a spiritual way when you can uh, pray for something and then it happens. You know, and you... What does that tell you? It tells you you're walking in the Spirit. It tells you that you're walking in the will of God. And that when you prayed for it, you were praying for what God wanted. And, and there's something about that that just fills you with joy as a Christian. And so, you know, it's not about obtaining this and that. I mean, God, is, God has all the resources He needs. You know, anything God wants, He can give you. But the reason you don't have it is probably because it's not good for you. You know, if you're talking about, you know, you, you want a new Mercedes or something. Maybe that's not what's best for you. And that's the reason why you don't have it. That's why you're driving a Chevy or whatever. Because God wants you to be humble. And, um, you, you know, just as an example right there. And then um, let's skip down to verse 5. And it says, or, or do you think that the, the scripture speaks to no purpose? He jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us. Mm -hmm. So the spirit 
the Spirit of God, which lives and dwells in us as Christians. And it says that uh, He jealously desires the Spirit which He has made to dwell in us. So actually, it's His Spirit. It's God's Spirit. But it's in you. And God, um, you know, we can only just imagine what that must be like. But that Spirit is in you, and God wants that. He wants that connection with you through the Spirit. And so when the Spirit is in you, and if you're living in a way where you're quenching the Spirit, or you are, you are uh, grieving the Spirit, you, you are, uh, you know, sort of s suppressing the activity of God in your life, even though you have the Holy Spirit, but through your stubborn disobedience, your human, you know, humanistic way of living, um, you're suppressing the activity of God in your life, even though you have the Spirit, I think that's what it's talking about here. He jealously desires the spirit which is made to dwell in us. So it's a situation that needs to be fixed and God will fix it. He will find a way to wake you up. God knows who his people are and he will not lose a single one of them. So if you have that spirit in you, if you have that fire of the Holy Spirit in you, even if it's just a little flame, but it's in there, God knows it's there and he's going to call you home and he's going to make it right. Um, it, it'll be better for you to cooperate in this process because God will do what he has to do to wake you up. And it could be, it could be something um, just, uh, it could be anything. It could be easy, it could be hard, but if you cooperate, it might be easy. Um, and then verse six, but he gives a greater grace. Therefore it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Okay, he gives greater grace. So we're saved by grace, received through faith in Jesus Christ. Maybe we had just a little bit of faith, just like a mustard seed, you know. And, uh, and so God's grace saved us just like that and gave us the Holy Spirit. And then for a new Christian or whatever, maybe they have just that little fire of the Spirit in them. And then God sees that uh, you still have these bad habits in your life, you know. And it, I mean, obviously, it's a process throughout your life, but you got to grow up. God wants you to grow up. So he's, he might see you. He does. He's not happy with some of the things you're doing in life. You're uh, quarreling with your brothers. You're, you're lusting after your pleasures for yourself and things like that. So what does he do? He gives greater grace. Wow, but he gives a greater grace. He'll give you more grace, more unmerited favor, more goodness that you don't deserve, that you did not earn. And, uh, and it says, uh, therefore it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Okay, so what if you're proud? Is he going to give you grace? Um, yeah, I mean... It, well, it says, he, it says he's opposed to the proud. God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Well, okay. So God will give you grace, but he'll humble you first. That's what I think it's kind of saying right there. If you're proud, if you're a child of God and you're going around full of pride, he's going to humble you. And that's part of his grace. That's because that's what you need. And that's why what I was saying about it's easier if you cooperate because if you're being stubborn, rebellious, you might get hit by lightning or something for all we know, you know what I mean? Just to wake you up and to humble you. And, uh, <laughs> and then when, when you do humble, you got this grace. So, but that's, that is a great verse. God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. You know, the world is totally full of pride. That's kind of, that's what they do. That's their thing. And um, Christians, we're called to be opposite. We're called to be humble, <clears throat> to not be like the world. And uh, so to love others and to, to not be selfish, to care about others, to love others, and to be humble. You know what I mean? And then we get grace and we get more grace. And it says, uh, verse 7, Submit therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Okay. Yeah. So in all that, you you submit to God, you be humble before God. Um, 
In so doing, you're able to resist the devil and he will flee from you. The devil really has no control over you. Um, it's just a temptation that he can do, but he cannot make you do anything. Um, you know, if you resist the devil, he, he will flee from you. That's what it says right here. And that's a great scripture. You know, if you ever find yourself under um, demonic attack or anything like that, just repeat this to yourself. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. And just remember that. That's a promise from God telling you that you have the power to resist the devil and he will flee from you. And uh, it's because of the, the work of Jesus Christ um, on the cross when he saved us that uh, we as Christians are able to stand up to the forces of evil and, uh, and to overcome. The, the victory has already been won, the victory um, in Jesus. And, uh, yeah, next verse. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, your sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. That's great. Just uh, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. He's waiting for you to, uh, to make the choice, to make the decision to not be following the world and to follow him, to draw near to him. And again, how do you do that? Prayer, Bible study, fellowship, ministry, all those kinds of things, all those good habits. And then, uh, <clears throat> you know, we're, we're almost out of time here, but I just want to, you know, just look at verse 9 real quick. It says, Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and He will exalt you. Yeah, and we'll just end it right there. So that's about, yeah, it's about being humble. You go through life being proud and all this. That's not right. We should be humbling ourselves. Um, let your, you know, it says, be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Well, uh, that's a very uh, intense way of saying it, but just don't be so proud of yourself is what it's saying. You need the grace of God. You need God's mercy to save you. And uh, you need it. You, want, you need the blessings of God, and you need the relationship with God, and you don't want that to let the devil um, come between that relationship or mess it up. Um, you don't want the world to mess it up either. We know as a child of God with the Holy Spirit in you, God is going to find a way to save you. I mean, actually, you're already saved. He's going to find a way to, to call you into a relationship with Him. And so that you can fulfill the calling that he has for you. And also just because God desires this love relationship for you. And God, came, came, he came to give you life and to give it life abundantly. So he doesn't want you to just scraping by. He wants you to come into the abundant fullness of life in Jesus Christ. And so <clears throat> in order for us to get there, you know, it's, it may not be that easy because we, ha we keep having these old bad habits that keep coming up. But, you know, it just, I mean, it does spell it out r right here. It spells it out very clearly in this James chapter 4 about the situation that's going on. And so your, your troubles, as a Christian, your troubles are coming from you are trying to be a friend to the world. You're trying to get along with the world and to get along with God. And it's, it's not going to work. You're going to have to choose one. And if you're a real Christian, then that choice has already been made. You're, you've chosen God. And then you have to realize that the world is something that you need to let go. I mean, we're still living in the world, but you have to let it go. And uh, you cannot let it be a crutch. You cannot... You don't want that influence because actually the world is evil and it leads to uh, all these things. Pride, it leads to quarreling, it leads to uh, conflicts and um, all these things that we don't need. And uh, we also have the devil, which is also attacking us and trying to make us think that we need the world when we really don't. 
We don't need the world. We don't need the devil. We can resist the devil. He will flee from us. Can we resist the world? Yeah, sure we can as Christians. But you just got to make that decision, you know, as a Christian. Are you going to be a real Christian? One who is filled with the Holy Spirit, on fire with the Spirit, who's um, walking in uh, obedience with God, walking in with fellowship with God. Someone who can pray and know that you're talking to God. You're not just talking to nothing. You, there's a two-way conversation, actually. And there's a spiritual um, side. And things, miraculous things happen. You pray for things, they happen. Sometimes God will tell you something that's going to happen, and it does. Or just tells you through the Spirit, you know. Just all just this miraculous stuff and then it, what happens you have this joy that uh, just surpasses all understanding that's different from happiness happiness depends on things working out joy just depends on knowing God you know God you're full of joy whatever whatever happens around you you could be in prison like Paul often was and you could be singing for joy you know singing songs of praise and all that so it really is the abundant life, that, that, uh, the Christian life. And it's something that we need to experience um, now, here and now. Sure, we have a great inheritance waiting for us in eternity, but it's, we, we start to experience it now. And just as uh, Romans 8 talks about, the, the Spirit himself is the first fruit of our inheritance as children of God. So let's go ahead and pray. Almighty God, we thank you for this sermon. Please help us to, um, yeah, I mean, there's some big lessons in there. Please help us to do it as Christians to, uh, first of all, to resist the devil and go ahead and let that devil flee from us, protect us from all harm and all evil, and help us to, um, you know, to not be a friend of the world or not to be friendly with the world. You know, help us to have the right, proper perspective on our place in the world and help us to be willing to reject the world in, in exchange for Christ and to, you know, to just to give up the worldly things that are against you, God, and to, uh, to just be here to represent you, Lord God, in the world. And give us that relationship with you, Jesus, uh, that spiritual relationship and um, give us the joy of knowing you, God. And uh, just please help us and strengthen us. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.